Hello everybody, welcome to Tactica Imperialis and to today's video. Today is episode 35 of Adeptus Podcasters and I am sad to report we are one host down. Remlays is ill, he's uh, really ill unfortunately. Um, some of you will know that if you've been following his community tab and other things. So he is out of commission for this episode. However, I still am joined by Ego Queen Alexis. Yeah. And we have been able to snag a replacement for Remlays, an individual who some of you will know, by the name of Viggy the GM. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Viggy the GM of Queen's Court Infamy, and I also handle the lore series for Alexis. Indeed. So hopefully we won't be missing out on too many lore insights, if any. More than likely so, none. Viggy's crazy uh, about it. Absolutely. <laughs> and yes, absolutely. So in the news this week, since, well, we've got a lot to cover since uh, we had the seven days of Nurgle, which came out on Christmas Day. And uh, it was a preview for a lot of Nurgle releases across both systems because it's for the demons for the most part. And starting us off, well, we will start big and work down. We have the great unclean one. <laughs> Yes, the new model looks quite, um, amazing. jolly. Look, Alexis, come on, it's it's amazing. It is, but it's it's so jolly looking, like, I just want to run up and just hug it. It depends on the yeah. variant you build. Uh, the variant with the sword does, the variant with the bell, not so much. Yeah, and the special character looks like a homeless great unclean one. <laughs> Yes, you can now build a special character akin to... Uh, it seems like Kugath has been retired um, by oh, the looks wow. of it. Uh, so your new Great Unclean One character is an individual called Rotigus. Um, you'll get some of his abilities a little later when we preview the Chaos Demons Codex, but for now we're just going to discuss the models and we'll get to the rules a little later. So, yeah, I don't quite know how big oh actually i can see it here this kit is ginormous and i love it am, am i the only one kind of excited to have a homeless unclean one it's like scabathrax's like nephew or something like <laughs> oh gosh scabathrax is just like ah oh, you know what i'm done here i'm leaving screw this you can take over go for it yeah, but by process of elimination, we just need the keepers now, and that's hinted at this summer. Yeah, yes. I've heard rumor of a summer of Slanesh, which uh, we'll hopefully see a great a keeper of secret stained character at last. Will we get Fulgrim? Hard to say, but it's the logical it's a, next choice. Well, the ne logical next choice is a loyalist, but details. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the Great Unclean one looks absolutely amazing and huge and terrifying, and hopefully its stat line, um, I can only speak for Age of Sigma here, I don't know its stat line in 40k, but hopefully its stat line will be buffed to match. Um, wasn't, because it's... Wasn't um, Scabathrax actually defeated to the point of banishment for over a thousand years? Wait, are you mixing up with Scarbrand? No, 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 Scabathrax was defeated when a Grey Knight learned his true name. You complete. I have no idea who this character is. I'm afraid. I, I, I. You may be mixing the planet that the world leaders went no, to. No, in um, in, no, that's in, in true name, Scavathrax, the great unclean one, was trying to possess a oh, gray knight. That one. Gray knight using the gray knight's original name, and in the process, he figured out the others. That is true. I remember this audiobook now. I sent it to you. Yes, you did. Ah, now I know what she's talking about. It's it's kind of a no name, so uh no wonder we were confused. Well, yeah, I mean it's a it's a what, 10-minute audiobook? Yeah. I say it very much went under my radar. Yeah, well, it's it's okay. It's a 5 out of 10. Fair enough. Yeah, the only like, named great unclean one that I could ring off the top of my head was Kugath. Uh, I'm kind of sad to see Kugath go, if I'm honest. Well, yeah, we don't know if he's coming it back. Is. Although you can... Well, depending if he has rules or not. Well, I don't think, because Rotigus exists, and generally they don't have more than one named type of demon, 
they do, they won't. So like Scarbrand is for Bloodthirsters, Kairos is for Lords of Change. The only named ones outside will, for Nurgle will be Rotigus. Kugath will exist in law, but I don't think he'll have rules for the sake of parity. Yeah, probably. Unless they do break up the Demon Codex into four actual codexes, in which case they uh, might bring multiple named characters into the game. It Doubtful. doesn't come across that way. Uh, uh, we'll discuss the Chaos Demons Codex in a bit. We'll get through the Nurgle models first. Uh, so next up is a pair, pair, yes, a pair of heroes, uh, new heralds, with some very hilarious names. Uh, the first one being the Sloppity Bile Piper. Yes, you did hear that right. <laughs> uh, who carries a set of bagpipes that appear to be made out of a heart. Aw, hmm. that's so cute. Because it's... Nurgle. It's disgusting, but it's no, amazing. That, that is music straight from the heart. It is a... F- oh, oh, God. Oh, oh, that hurt. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is a really cool, like, jolly, one-eyed plague bearer with a massive tongue and a hood. and I don't know. Also, the nurgling at his feet, I, I, I don't even want to know. I, okay, I do have to mention this fairly quickly. The Nurgle, uh, the Nurgling models that are on the characters and on the greater demons and everything are the best thing that Nurgle has to offer aside from the buggy bot. You mean the bloat drone? Yes, the blight hauler, technically, but. Right. It, they are all adorable. If you want a really cute army, just Nurgle. Uh, Nurgle and cute in the same sentence do, no does not compute. I'm oh, sorry, that doesn't. Horrible. Remember, this is coming from the Slaneshi cult. This I'm not sure what she's onto. Good point. The other hero that you're getting is the Spoilpox Scrivener, uh, who carries a massive scroll and has basically an elephant trunk, which is unique. New new Epidemius. Uh, no, um, I don't think he'll be the, because that's an unnamed character. I think we'll still have Epidemius. Well, uh, Epidemius is in the index, so regardless, we have him. Oh, well. Good oh, point. Question, Kugath isn't in the index? Um, I would have to check, but I'm unsure. I don't own it to, uh, check, I'm afraid. I do not either. Right, um, so yeah, they've got these two new heroes to do. We're going to be very useful. We'll get to their rules again a little bit later. The, uh, the next, <laughs> he's the scribbler. That's so scrivener, funny. scrivener. Yeah, the scribbler. Yeah, he likes to play forty k Scrabble. Please, I know you can't English, but please. <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, uh, that then... is amusing. Yeah. Um. Anyway, <laughs> we then have two Age of Sigma uh, kits, uh, which are uh, Mortal Nurgle, so I'll skip over those because people don't care about Age of Sigma unless you're me. Um, and then we have the Beasts of Nurgle, which... Yeah, these actually... I'm, I've am i actually been more used to these kinds of beasts because I play Blood Bowl, well, the computer game, that is. Right. And those look very Blood Bowl beasts. So... Uh- Okay. So at least they're on theme. That's fair. I mean, I have very mixed feelings about them. I don't know. I... I don't know. They don't grab me. Like The, the old beasts of Nurgle were, but in a way... But, but Michael, they have so many tentacles. Why can't they grab you? Yay, I didn't make the joke. <laughs> oh, goodness <laughs> sake. But okay, I'll put it another way. The, I liked the old Beast of Nurgle kit as old and outdated as it was. I quite liked it. Um, Fair enough. And I don't know something about this. It's like, I mean, the one that they they preview particularly is just like the beast is supposed to be this thing that races ahead in, in its, desi- its like, desire to get to grips and hug the enemy to death. And it's like this doesn't feel at all like that. It doesn't feel like something that's quite agile, well, despite being nerglish. I don't know. Michael, remember, demons don't follow the same laws of physics that we follow. I know they don't. I know they don't follow physics, but like, you look at a blood letter and you think, that is a life-powerful killing machine, and it is. You look at a Lord of Change and you think, 
okay, that thing is going to be quite powerful, but it's got a massive staff, it's got the avian things. I don't know, it feels like a sorcerer. This doesn't feel... It feels well, just like a, a like a mini great unclean one, just like a lump of stuff that isn't fast. Well, yeah, that's by what Nurgle standards. is, though. But by, by Nurgle standards, like, you look at a, a bloat drone... Um, and you think, okay, they're they're not going to be super fast like I don't know seekers and their steeds, but they've got wings and they they look almost a little bit fast. And the old beast of Nurgle kit was the same; they were small by comparison to what I'm assuming these kits are going to be. But they felt a little bit lithe and like they were actually rushing towards you. These feel like ponderous. I don't know; just something about them doesn't convince me. Well, the well, thing about demons is they move on a, a different plane of existence they are physical they do have all their internal I still agree. organs well oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the point that michael is making is that aesthetically it does not seem to convey its message properly yeah, it's aesthetic doesn't well, feel like that i know physically it can do it but aesthetically it doesn't feel like it i'm just gonna point this out the damn thing looks like barney the dinosaur you can paint one purple if you want but i do like that the kids uh, are looking more like their rogue trader um, counterparts. The the old art style of Nurgle was always happy and cheerful and like pustulant and disgusting looking, but still which, everything was which, happy. Yeah, something that they've been pushing with the latest Nurgle models is the sunshine and happiness and s slithering guts. Yeah, because um, I actually just got my hands on Blight War, which is relevant to Nurgle players because Horticular Slimux is coming to 40k as well. And reading the law on Slimux, which I'm assuming is going to be the same on both sides, um, he is... He's hes not the jolliest chappy. He's quite dour by Nurgle standards, but he still comes across like he enjoys what he does. Um... Not because he's always angry all the time, like Corn is now conveyed to be. Not because he's insane, but because he genuinely finds it amusing or worthwhile. Mm. All right. I agree that... with that. And to finish off, we also have a new piece of terrain. I'm, I believe it's yep, it's going to be in both systems. It's the feculent gnarl law, which is not called a blight tree, despite the Christmas Carol calling it a blight tree. Well, have you tried putting, uh, what was the name of it? The Feculent Nalmore is the name of the... Yeah, try rhyming that. Oh yeah, but why don't they just call it the Blight Tree? I mean, they have Blight Drones. Well, maybe, uh, maybe it was just artistic license with the whole song. Yeah, it might be. Um, and the reason this is quite interesting is Slimux is going to be able to spawn them as well, which is something Jeez. that... That Age of Sigmar has allowed you to do in the past um, with the uh, the Dryad the Sylvaneth, but it's the first one we've seen terrain spawning in 40k, right? Uh, no. I know terrain moving has been a thing, but I don't know about terrain spawning. Uh, Tyranids used to be able to do it in a certain mission in Apocalypse. But not all the time. This is going to be a persistent ability. Yeah, yeah. So it is. It is rather unique. Um. Is there anything else that spawns terrain? I know there's a lot of units that affect terrain, but none that actually I mean, bring them into play. Aside from just bringing your own terrain with rules as fortifications, no, not really. Yeah, I think it's the only time I've seen it. Yeah, I know like Warhammer Fantasy and Age of Sigmar uh, have had a tradition of spawning terrain, but not so much 40k. Yeah, because fantasy, I think you could do it a bit in Storm of Magic. The Silver Neth and Age of Sigmar have been able to do it since they came out. Yeah, and, actually, um, actually, yeah. actually, the Awakening of the Wood spell uh, could pop down a forest for the Wood Elf. Actually, Lore of Life uh, magic um, users. No, the Lore of Life Awakening of the Wood spell did more damage in terrain. Oh, my bad. I my, my bad. I was... I may be mis misremembering that one. No, don't worry. Right? Fantasy is now three years dead, nearly three years dead and gone. Rest in peace, fantasy. R rip. Uh, right. Now, something that Alexis, I'm sure, is much more looking forward to talking about. Let's talk rules. Um, I tend not to play Nurgle. I tend to almost No, this is the them. demons. This is all demons. Oh, okay, okay, okay. 
So yes, Chaos Demon Codex, we knew this was coming. We'd had this previewed a while out. So Chaos Demon Codex is coming in January, uh, which is still January to me, because, damn it, that was too good of a pun. Um, uh, yeah, even I have to sigh at that one, Michael. You you giggled at my joke, but... Oof. And GW's pun. They made the pun eight years ago, nearly. You remembered it. They tried to let it die. I remembered it because it was like the fifth white dwarf I ever bought. And it was like just after I started Orc. So of course I remembered. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, um, a thing for the demons. Um, When taking a pure demons of chaos detachment, you'll be rewarded with warlord trait stratagems. However, if you commit yourself to a single god, you get extra rewards. These are called loci, which have been completely changed uh or maybe they seem to be applied to characters they seem to have changed in some way um well i'm sure you guys know the loci better than i do um so it looks like demon players can do what they want but they're going to be rewarded for specializing and i approve i mean that makes sense with the whole great game and everything where the demons war with themselves war with each other but will occasionally war together to kill something agreed yeah. Actually, do you have the loci up? I don't. Uh, I do. Um, all of the... Uh, they're all in the individual god previews, so I'm just going to go through them god by god. Um, so we'll do all of Korn, then all of Zinj, then all of Nurgle, then all of Slanesh, rather than just do the loci and then skip back and do well, each yeah, god. Well, yeah, you have to finish with Slanesh. Uh... Hey, if Michael can make a terrible pun... I can make a terrible that, joke. That, what, that, that GW you made. Yeah. It wasn't my pun. You still said it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let us begin with Corn, And they have the Locus of Rage. Uh, this is applied to all of your characters if you specialize and take a Corn detachment. And what it does is that for each uh, demon Corn demon unit within six inches of a friendly model with the Locus of Rage, you can re-roll your charges. Yeah, Black Templar. Ooh. Except it's only for the within auras, it's not your entire army. So worse Black Templar, yay. But on an army that's better in combat, so six and two threes. Yeah, they're they're generic freaking Grey Knights. The Grey Knight Grandmasters get this ability. I see. Uh, but to be fair, that's that's quite a thing that we've seen of like abilities being conferred as to traits. Like the Tower of Commander ability has now become a Warlord trait, for example, in Chapter Approved. Um, mm-hmm. Just a random one. Uh, a Relic for Corn. I've got two of them, actually. Uh, the Armor of Scorn. This is for Corn monsters only. So pretty much Bloodthirsters and Demon Princes and potentially like Skull Cannons. Do they get monster? No. Uh, no, I think they're not classified that way. I don't believe so either. Um, so it's for your bloodthirsters and demon princes and named equivalents. Um, it gives you a 4 plus invulnerable save and the ability to deny a psychic power in the enemy's psychic phase. Just no rules need no roll needed? Uh, attempt to deny, sorry. Ah, right. Yeah, so you uh, still so... roll the 2d6 like you're a normal psyker. Oh. Yeah, so basically it turns your guy into a, a, a psyker to some extent uh, because Korn has no psychers, obviously. I will, well. go in, I, I will not go into sorcery, and Alexis, you will not either. Okay. Well. Corn has I'll... no demon psychers, then. Sorry, do I need to get super picky? Well. Alexis, we're moving <laughs> what? on. What? The one guy was ascended to demon prince. <sighs> Move on, Michael. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Just in terms of analyzing this relic, I think it's really good just for a 4 plus invulnerable save. Like, that extra pip of invul makes a big difference on demon characters. I've noticed that the difference between a 4 and a 5 is substantial. Well, I mean, it's uh, a free upgrade, so yeah, se- you take it. 17%? Yes, it is only 17 I know it's 17% every time, but the difference between a 4-up and 5-up... I mean, obviously on Involunt, it's less different compared to armor because you don't have AP, but it is still nice to have. That uh, is true. The other relic we've got is Skull Reaver, which is a relic for any corn model that has the Axe of Corn a great axe of corn or a demonic axe. I don't know exactly which units those are. Obviously, bloodthirsters will be included. I don't know if that also applies to heralds, but I believe not. 
No, they don't use axes. I don't. I, not any of those weapons. I don't think. I would agree because looking at its stat line, it looks like it's a weapon for a bloodthirster. So it's a melee weapon that confers plus three strength, minus four AP, and is damage D six. So if you put this thing on a bloodthirster, I'm not sure of its stat line, but I'm gonna assume its strength seven. So probably. Sh- I think it's more like eight or nine base. I feel like a bloodthirster has got a titanic strength stat. Yeah, so it's more than likely above strength 10, and an AP of minus 4 is insane. But the D6 damage, alright. Uh, and now if the it reason targets this a is... titanic thing, it gets a D3 mortal wounds. And rerolls to wound. Yep. So the ability is it rerolls fail wound rolls against titanic units, so that's super heavies and gargantuans in, in old speak. And on the wound roll of a 6 or more, after modifiers, you do D3 mortal wounds on top. This thing is basically... A night one-shot killing machine. It's the throw... Emperor's Sword. The Emperor's Sword does that? Yeah, it's the Emperor's Sword. I didn't think the Emperor's Sword was that good. Yeah, on sixes it causes D3 mortal wounds. Oh, I was thinking about the whole general stat line, sorry. No. <laughs> uh, actually, maybe. Uh, no, I think Gilliman only goes up to strength seven with it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and finally for Corn, we have a Warlord trait, which is a slightly better version of the 6 plus feel no pain Warlord trait. Uh, so basically every time you lose a wound on a roll of a 6, you do not lose that wound, and you get to reroll all failed hits and wounds for your Warlord until the end of your next turn. Now that is slightly better than what the... There, there are different units that have this rule, and the one that springs to mind is the Electro Priests, which for some reason have ignoring wounds, but not a feel no pain. Yeah, it's, it's the same as disgustingly resilient that Nurgle has. That is true. This, this feels the, this feels like the new favorite rule that Games Workshop likes, just giving almost everything. Well, yeah, because go on. Have you seen how many saves an orc? A uh, pain boy or a mech has. I have not. They get you have four, your armor. They, they get have your four armor saves. Slashing. How four? I, I can see two. They have their armor, their invo. They oh, have, sorry. I bet you can take it any one time. Sorry. They have the pain boy save. And then on top of that, they have the six up ignore damage. So on average, they're getting three saves to one wound. Yeah, there's three saves, because you've got either armor in Vaughn, then uh, Doc's tools, then the cyborg body, if you take it. Yeah. Oh, and then the six-up save, if you take the Warlord trait. On the Warlord trait, yeah. So that's four saves. Sheesh. Too bad they all garbage. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, mechs, I, mech's got a big benefit out of chapter approved with that plus one strength Warlord trait, but at the same time, I don't think I'd ever take a big mech as my leader, just because I want war. I always take a big mech as my leader. Yeah, I, I just want to make one last thing. Uh, oh, I didn't realize that, but then again, you're better at this game than I am. Um, one last thing I want to point out with this Warlord trait is it says, until the end of your next turn. That means if you can make it pop on your turn, it you will last you until yes. the end of your next. Yeah, it's kind of insane. Admittedly, it's more than likely you'll have to take your own save first when your enemies attack from range but if you can make it pop on your turn that's pretty silly would uh, that also... count after overwatch yes yeah, it says each time yeah so just charge a gigantic squad hope they do one wound and bam you're done as long as you can then roll a six as well yeah i mean statistics and all that yeah um, right, I think that's everything for Corn. Now, Zinch. Zinch is interesting. They've learned their lesson from the fate dice of Age of Sigma, which are broken, and they've given them the Locus of Trickery. Um, so at the start of each fight phase, roll 2d6 and discard the highest result. Until the end of that fight phase, each time your opponent targets a Zinch Demon unit within six inches of a model with the Locus and makes a hit roll that, after rerolls but before modifiers, matches your remaining dice result, that hit roll fails. This works on Magnus. 
Yes, because he's a demon of Zinch. Yep. Just keep that in mm-hmm. mind. Mm-hmm. However, Magnus would have to be... Uh, uh, no, it's fine. Ignore me. And especially with Zinch, you're already going to have warped. Zinch is probably the quickest army, um, a single moving army in the game right now. Because Screamers. No, because of stupid warp time. Oh. I see. But in all technicality, all the demon armies and all the Chaos Space Marine armies can take that. It's just that it's it's a Zinch ability. Right, I see. Uh, but the main... This won't do much because, one, it's a combat ability, and generally Zinch doesn't want to be in combat unless, like, certain units. And, two, it's you keep the lowest, so if you roll, like, a a one and a five, then hit rolls of one fail, which is useless. Which, yeah. Also, if it's one or twos, you're maybe out of luck? Yeah, it will vary. Like, the, the ideal one you want to hit is probably... Well, obviously, six is the ideal one you want to hit, because some people have things that trigger on a six. Oh my but... god, you can use this in combination with Brimstone Horrors. Oh no. Oh joy! Yeah, they, as if they weren't annoying enough to begin with. Oh, you want to talk about annoying? Let's talk about Nurglings, dear God. She well, well they yeah. don't. Well, they, when they die, they die. They don't keep coming back. Yeah, they're just impossible to kill. Well, uh, stratagem. Yep, uh, so we have a stratagem here for Zinch, uh, Locus of Conjuration. At the start of your psychic phase, you can use this for two command points. Select a Zinch demon character from your army, and that, um, and for the rest of your phase, you can reroll any failed psychic test made for friendly Zinch demon units within six inches. Okay. Yeah, this is pretty, pretty easy. Yeah, there's nothing special, but it's... It's going to have a lot of uses if you're going to be going crazy for a particular early psychic phase. Which, if yeah. you've seen, you're definitely doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we also have a psychic power that they're getting uh, called Flickering Flames. Five to cast, 18 inch range, target a friendly Zinch Demon unit, and you can add plus one to their wound rolls for their shooting weapons. Oh, joy, look at that. More flamers. A Zinch Demon unit. With ranged attacks? Actually, don't all of the... No, wait. Is it just the Flamers? Horrors yeah. apparently do as well. Oh, right. This do, this feels... Well, it is a pretty low power, but it is somewhat lackluster. Uh, I mean, it does take a unit of Flamers and make them burn through a Terminator squad with relative ease. Yeah. Or biker units or artillery. Yeah, because you have effects that trigger on a six, they now trigger on a five plus. I don't know if Zinch does, but. Hmm. I'll but have yes. to look into this one a little bit more. I feel like my knowledge on Zinch is not that. I, yeah. I, know, I know their combat role in other armies, I don't know their combat role on their own. That's fair. Uh, to finish off, uh, you have the impossible robe, which well, that's is just a... impossible. Which gives a four plus invulnerable save and the ability to once per game re-roll a single failed save. But if you re-roll as a one, you die. That feels like a b- bad lucky stick. <laughs> it does. I mean, like, the lucky. We haven't seen the lucky stick for a while, but. Yes. That's what it reminded me of. But it's not re-rolls all the time, it's you pick which one to re-roll. So you could say, I'm on one wound, I need to make this save or I die anyway. Yeah, that is true, that is true. It, it's just one of those you just have to think about. Well, it feels like just a very, very specific command point. I mean... Yes, it is. It's a free command point for when you need it. Yeah, I guess. Now, returning to Nurgle, unless people have anything to add on Zinch. Nope. Oh, I do. Fucking Uh Magnus. Ah. As is tradition. 
Right. Uh, now, Nurgle has the Locus of Virulence. Now, this is... Uh, if it's anything like the Age of Sigmar equivalent, this is terrifying. Each time you make a wound roll of a six or more for a Nurgle demon unit within six inches of any friendly model with the Locus of Virulence, that attack does one more damage. Ooh. That's really good for Mortarian. Yes. Um, the only catch is there are no mounted heralds for Nurgle, so units that will benefit from this greatly, like um, bloat drones, um, will not get it unless you have like a flying demon prince to keep up. Uh, yeah, but a warp time demon is, is really common. Don't you mean warp speed? Yeah. No. Isn't it warp time that makes you move twice? Or is that warp speed? I always get those two confused, so if I did, my bad. Yeah, I'm I'm also talking without shenanigans. I talk with the shenanigans. Because I know you the are. exact player that's going to be using this against me, and I'm gonna be like, you're a butt, and then I'm gonna burn him with flamethrowers. Because of course you are. Now, Nurgle Demons also get a stratagem, which is a pre-battle stratagem. Uh, for one command point, choose one of your Nurgle models with a icon which is upgraded, uh, which it still does what everything it's supposed to do. But uh, you can use once per game, when you are chosen to attack, your Plague Swords for that unit become damaged too. Which if Holy you can stack crap. with the loc, which if you stack with the Locus, means that if you can get a 6 to wound and activate the banner in the same turn, they're damaged 3 each. Goodbye Terminators. Goodbye everything? If we can't make Terminators terrible enough... Actually no, well, that's really good for getting rid of like Shadow Swords and things like that. Things that are... Really difficult for most armies to deal with. The only catch is going to be you're still fighting at Plague Bearer stats, because Plague Swords are mainly a Plague Bearer weapon, and you don't have Rend. Well, that's Maybe. that's actually kind of fine, because if you are slamming into, and I'm going to keep using this because this is one of the most common things that people have problems with, if you're slamming into a Shadow Sword, dealing that 3 damage because you're only wounding it on a 6 regardless is kind of amazing. True, but then you've also got to get to like a two-up save. Yeah, that's fine. Sheer volume of attacks will tear it down very quickly. Statistically, you need to be making 36 hits just to do that three damage. That's fine. You're bound that's to fail hit. one or two of them, and all you need to do is lower it by one stat line to make it useless. Is there anything that does that? Hang on. Um, well, no, I mean the no. tank itself. You lower it by one stat, and it's... Yeah, but how do you... Know, do you, do you they don't vehicle. generally reduce... They don't generally lose save, though. No, but from vehicle damage. It goes uh, from hitting on a 4-up to hitting on a 5-up. Yeah, all right. I, I get where you're going with it. It's just one of those things that, like, if you need a lot, a lot of stacking to make it work. Also, you can base it if you have enough Plague Marines. Uh, plague... Pox. Bearers. Plague bearers. Thank you. I'm thinking of the freaking, um... The... Pox walkers. Yes. But even so, this is still a really good ability, especially if you need to bog down tough infantry. Oh, yeah. It'd be good for just like, a, a random... Like, particularly if you want to like, cast character assassinate as well. Oh, um, yeah. Like, Very like easily. Mid, like mid-tier characters um, who've got like maybe 8 to 10 wounds and a not too up save. This could be really quite nasty to pop. Actually, this can even kill the bigger characters as well. Like, Reboot Gilliman versus 30 Plague Bearers. Reboot Gilliman yeah. will fail a couple of those saves and eventually go down. I agree. It's, it's, it's just you've, got to, you've just got to use it wisely. Now, mm -hmm. uh, one of the new characters, uh, the Spoilpot Scrivener, the Scribe guy, he's got an ability that buffs your Plague Bearers to hell. Um, so he gives plus one to hit for all Plague Bearer units within six inches. And if your hit roll is a 7, so you roll a natural 6, you get another attack. Huh, that's pretty neat. Though this does not go infinite as usual. Yep. How, how wonderfully fluffy. Yep, and then we also have Horticular Slimux, who is your beast-centric character, just like he is in Age of Sigmar. So he gives rerolls of charges for beast units within 6 inches, and plus one to hit for beast units within 12 inches. You have a lot of talking in the background. Oh, I think there's someone at the door, sorry. I didn't realize it was coming through that loud, because I can barely hear it. Yeah, we can hear it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Um, anyway, I'll, I'll just keep talking and maybe I can try and drown it out. Um, he also has the ability to, as I said earlier, add a feculent normal to your army at the end of the movement phase. It sets up within three inches of him and one inch away from everything else. You cannot do this if you did demonic ritual, which I'm assuming is summon. Yep. Can't summon uh, two things in. Yeah, and the Narmor itself uh, gives all Nurgle demon units that are not vehicles and monsters within seven inches of it, uh, as in, yeah, completely within, not actually in it, just com within seven inches of it, get plus two to their save. Damn. Not invulnerable, just their save. Yeah, and... but still, that's good. Uh, I mean, j can they take cover? No. no. They, count, they count as being in cover, but with an extra oh. save on top. Right, 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 okay. Uh, and then it also gives all Nurgle demon units within seven inches the ability to uh, either shoot or charge, even if they fell back or ran. Mm, nice. Indeed. So you can what you can do there as a combo is get Slamox up the board with some beasts, drop the Gnarl more, and then because you've advanced your Plague Barriers into range, you can suddenly then just bomb forward a bit further, which is quite nasty. All right, so reading over this and uh, Corn from before... How come Nurgle seems like a better melee army than Korn? I think the main reason is, like, if you give Korn too many buffs to their combat abilities, like, the only thing Korn's lacking is attacks to stop it just being utterly insane. Because I fought Korn demons on New Year's Eve, and they they hit plenty hard already. Did you, you fight Epidemus? What? Um, Epidemus. The little dude in the chair. Epidemius, you mean? Sorry. Yeah. Did you fight right, him? Sorry, I was fighting Corn. Oh, Corn. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you said Nurgle. No, Corn no, hits plenty. I fought Nurgle in Age of Sigma, but I fought Corn in 40k, and uh, they hit plenty hard already, uh, without any real abilities on them. So they can't do too much, or they just become insane, assuming they can make it to melee. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, a relic for the uh, Force of Nurgle is the Horn of Nurgle's Rot. Roll a d6 each time the bearer kills an enemy model in the fight phase within 7 inches of one or more friendly units of Plague Bearers. On a 4+, plus, you can add a Plague Bearer to one of those units. Oh, that's kind of terrible. I mean, it's not that bad. It's not it's that bad. It's not kill, stellar, but... Kill one, get one free. On a 4+. plus. Yeah. So... And it's only you only get one model no matter how many you kill. So it could be kill 10, get one. Ah, okay, so... I think I read that is, right anyway. Yeah, this, this feels more... Uh, this feels like, oh, Nurgle's Rod is a thing. We should probably do something No, 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 no. I'm wrong. Yeah, it's when it it's kills an enemy model. It's not kills one or more, it's an. Okay, so yeah, it is... Oh. It is kill one, get one free. Oh. On a four plus. Oh, never mind then. That's... Yeah. All right, and finally, Slanesh. I realize I've been going quite slowly through this. Uh, the locus for Slanesh is run and charge for all Slanesh demon units in six inches of a friendly model with the locus. Oh, it's so ridiculous. It's war. Yeah, it is war. It's completely war. Well, it's war without the reroll. Yeah, you have here we go on top of that, but that's a separate rule. Um, so, yeah. War light. Yeah, it's war light. Exact it's exactly why why gets the extra benefit from here we go, which is a but separate rule. Seekers but, move incredibly far. You just need to have a herald that can keep up with them. Which you can put a herald on a seeker. That's I've never seen a herald on steed before. Fair enough. It's it's insane. Now um, the mark of excess. This is one of their relics, I believe. Um, is it? No, I think it might be a wool trait. I can't tell. Um, it doesn't say, uh, but I think, I think it's a relic. Um, so what it is, is plus one attack, add one each time you kill a character or a monster. Okay, now let me tell you all the reasons why that's insane. Slanesh has the most attacks out of all the Chaos Demons. Correct. The Demon Princes, if they hit into something, the Slanesh Demon Princes, they are going to annihilate it. Giving Probably them correct. more attacks on top of that is even more insane. Yeah, you have to kill characters or monsters, so it can be played around a bit, but it is powerful. Well, I mean, you're just going to jump over them. Any walls or anything that they put in the way. In the case of a flying demon prince, yes. Uh, we also have 
two Warlord traits here. Um, one of them is Quicksilver Duelist, which actually stacks with the Mark of Excess, because it means you can reroll hit and wound rolls in the fight phase against characters. Yeah, there's a the theme going on here. The other one, though, is Bewitching Aura, which is, gives minus one attack to non-vehicle enemies within six inches of your Warlord, so they're harder to kill. Oh my god, that's actually insane. Alexis, uh, so how's that uh, Slanishi army looking? Well, I have 15 uh, uh, Cacophony, I have five Steeds, and I have uh, three Bikers. And you realize that you kind of need some more demons because it's all for demons, this. But uh, yeah, fair play. Oh, yeah. Well, the bikers are going to be uh, steeds. They're going to be the leaders of them. Yeah. Uh, Carrying on, we have a psychic power, Phantasmagoria, which is warp charge six, minus one leadership for all enemy units within 12. Now, if you actually take an allied detachment of... Um, Chaos Space Marines, and you give them the mark of, well, the Night Lord's trait. It minuses, I mentioned this. It minuses one on top of, it minuses three on top of that, and if you bring Warp Talons, you minus more. So all you would have to do is kill one model, watch them fail a leadership test, and lose six models. Yeah, it's rather bonkers. <laughs> yeah, except there's a lot of armies that are going around with, and they shall know no fear, or fearless. Yeah, like, orcs have mob rules, their, their leadership is insane. Uh, the tower have the bonding knife rituals, they can sort of half dodge it if they can get a lucky six. Uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. Finally, we have a stratagem, an aura of the... Aurea? Aura of acquiescence, which is, select a slash demon from your army, enemy units in three inches, take another minus one attack. So if you use this stratagem in combination with the Bewitching Aura Warlord trait, then everything within three inches is at minus two attacks. Nothing is besting your character in nothing is besting your demon prince in combat. Unless yeah. they get really lucky. Yeah, like that, that that's the thing is I don't like that ability. Not because it's bad, but because it's completely uninteractive. It's like, oh yeah, I've charged you. You're all at minus two attacks to a minimum of one. Have fun while I rip you a new one for the next five minutes. Well, and I you mean, can you do could, nothing back. You can simply just retreat and then shoot the crap out of the demon. It, I don't know, it's like abilities that take away your opponent's ability to fight back. Not not reduce, like, reducing their toughness is one thing, reducing their leadership is one thing, but taking their attacks away or sapping their strength or... Putting the marker old, lights on them. That doesn't change their ability to fight. <laughs> their actual combat ability or any general ability doesn't change. But things like paroxysm used to drive me nuts. Wow, uh, you would hate to fight the Dark Angels. Their entire gimmick is to mess with your opponent's stat line. Great. Yeah. Also, you do... Well, a counterpoint to that is that Slaneshi demons are super fragile, so if you do get that lucky hit in, you're probably killing it. Yep, that is one of the biggest drawbacks of Slanesh. Yeah, Fair. Slanesh has always been the a demon class demon demon. don't have... Well, characters don't have anything to fight back, so this is their defense. Yeah, their defense is completely making the game uninteractive, but hey. I get I get why they're doing it, and I understand why it needs to be done, But and it means that they have the same as Korn, they have that vulnerability to shooting, because as much as they can hit really, really hard, they can't take a hit, and Korn's like a slightly tougher version of Slanesh with less attacks for that reason. I get it, it's just, it's. I find it a little bit sad that they're taking away the ability of the enemy to fight back. Yeah, but that's always been Slanesh's thing in the lore. Mm, I suppose, it, it just, just I, I've, when I go into games and like, I'm just, my entire game is spent removing models because I can't do anything because, oh, your stat line is, you know, you've got five saves that you can roll and you've taken all my stats away, and you've got massive amounts of rends and mortal wounds. That's just completely boring, dull, and annoying and uninteractive. As I sit here with Sisters of Battle, when somebody gets into melee with me, I just take my model off the table. I don't bother rolling dice. So, okay, you killed it. <laughs> Except for the tanks. Well, fair. 
But yes, that is your news this week, ladies and gentlemen, uh, which should be uh, interesting. So let us know what you think of the Demon release, uh, because obviously it won't be out yet, or will it? I don't think it'll be out yet. It might just be on pre-order. Um, but it'll be very interesting to see how they stack up to everybody else and whether mixed demons can work or whether it will be all god, all or like single god, and then which gods are the most powerful. My money's on Zinch because uh, Zinch is just full of nonsense, always has been. Uh, uh, Nur- Nurgle feels strong right now. They all feel why. strong, but the Zinch and shenanigans, because they can do it at range, worries me. I, I really like Slanesh because Endless Cacophony plus uh, minusing all of your leadership plus the best spells in the game. Granted, Again, Cacophony on demons, but... Hmm? Yeah, you just take a battalion of regular demons and you get all the abilities and then you just move on to another detachment. Yeah, I mean, all the pretty much every ability is Slanesh Demon, so it'll only half work, but yes, yeah, make a fair point. I love it. I can't wait for my demon friends to figure this one out. They're going to love it. Well, I wouldn't fairness, be surprised. In all fairness, one of the biggest things that I want to do is I want to have an army of lair and just do it up like that. Run them as steeds of Slanesh. I can't wait to build that army. It's going to be insane. Wait, yeah. How exactly are you going to convert those? Uh, Ravners. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah that, that could work. I'm going to be using Ravners and a bunch of green stuff because I am going to be designing their arms and everything using just green stuff and Slanesh bits. Um, their heads, I'm probably going to go with a more corrupted version of them, so I'm probably just going to use demonette heads. Well, they are described in the Fulgrim book as having uh, insectoid heads, but yeah. it doesn't... Well, there, I don't think there's any insectoid model in 40k. Yeah, there is none. Well, there's the Tyranids, but the Tyranids don't look... Like, their faces don't look enough like bugs to actually pass off as lair. No, they look more like dinosaurs. But, uh, questions? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything uh, news related unless there's something coming out from not Warhammer community that people want to discuss. Oh, um, Winner Hero Fant is pretty cool. Oh, oh yeah, yes. That's cool. Forge World are doing a competition. That and... is true. <laughs> no, it's, it's going to be fun. So, I guess we're on to questions? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, I'll be handling these this week because obviously it would normally be Remley's, but he is uh, unfortunately dead. out of commission. Uh, not dead, but just out of commission. Okay, let's see what we can find. I told shall him not we? to pick up the flower of Nurgle. And, you know, he just did it. It's a bad idea. Look, that's what radical heretical inquisitors get. Well, he just wanted to take a stroll through the Garden of Nurgle because he thought it sounded neat or something like that. Or he had to get some uh, chaotic artifact for some reason. And, you know, he comes back and falls down on the ground and starts rotting. And I'm just like, this is why I didn't go there. So I carried him to sickbay. Fair enough. Okay, uh, let's start this off. And uh, the first question that comes in, I think we all know the answer to this one, but was the Emperor a good general? Yes. Yeah. Because their, their like logic is they the guy played favourites, he didn't really care about or understand the personalities of those below him, didn't really do communication, made a slew of basic command mistakes, I'm quoting here. So was he actually that good as a general? Well, his... Uh, like. His the Great Crusade was going great, pun intended, until, well, it never actually halted or anything like that. It just kept going until Horus made a U-turn. I personally think Fulgrim might have been a better general. Uh well, it's well, he's not compare. He's at, not asking him to compare to anyone. He's just asking, was the emperor a good general? And yeah, that's pretty think- easy answer. Yeah, I think like, in an individual battle, he was a he was obviously a very strong warrior. He could carry a battle pretty much on his own most of the time. Um, 
and he obviously knew what he was doing. Um, but whether he's the finest military mind humanity has ever spawned doesn't I'm, matter. It doesn't matter. But like when you think of the emperor, you think of like the the paragon of everything, and we know person that as a as a not general, he was a very good scientist, bit of a useless human being. Um, but it's just interesting to actually try and reflect on like, how he did militaristically. Because if you think about, like, yeah, I'm just going to completely abandon this and not leave any instruction for uh, the general succeeding me. And uh, we sort of, if you believe Remnant's theory, it might have been a bit rushed. So there was no super overarching plan that was very clear. Um, I sort of get what they're saying, but yeah, I think he was a good general. Well, the problem with that is that there is no... We, we actually have never seen the Emperor lead an army... We've Not, only had tales of him talk about leading an army. Yeah, and the other thing is, until we get his uh, Horus Heresy rules, we don't know just how good of a general he is. Mm. So, yeah. to to uh, pending answers, uh, ask again once the rules are out and uh, once the heresy is done. That is fair. Once that they... is fair. Once they actually move forward with the Horse Heresy book series and actually do the Siege of Terra, I would love to hear how the Emperor plans to fight uh, fight the traitors back. But even in Master of Mankind, he was kind of... No, he did take command and lead his army to victory. Well, yeah, but he didn't actually give... Well, we didn't hear him give any commands. He could have been commanding it psychically, but... The only thing that we saw was him laying some smackdown on demons. Yeah, and, it came. Uh, sorry, finish point. Yeah, it came at the end. I, I, uh, I pretty much agree yeah, with you. And it came across like his base. Uh, I haven't read Master of Mankind personally, but it comes across as though he jumped off the golden throne, ran into the webway, smacked Drachny in the face, and then ran out again. Actually, Drachny and stabbed him almost in the heart and kill- nearly killed him. Spoilers, but you know. The book's old enough, I think we can get away with it now. Oh, well, oh, well. But it's, yeah, it did feel like he ran in to save the day and just covered the escape and not much else. So, yeah, uh, examples are needed. President must be be set. And uh, we will answer that perhaps later. Well, you. Yeah, we'll hope so, yes. Now, this is one a bit more generic. Uh, what kind of major developments, not little releases, uh, major developments do you expect slash want in the coming year in regards to lore, tabletop, and, for some reason, video games? Ah, uh, Alexis, do you want to go first? Uh, no, you can. Oh, sweet. So, I was wondering, if they are going to do su- Summer of Slanesh, don't they need an opponent for that? The Inari. I was actually... Here's here's my thinking, and hear me out. Go on. What if they... Uh, what if they... What if they... What's the word I'm looking for? What if they juxtapose the Slaneshi with the Sister of Battle release? Ooh, that would be cool, because they can <sighs> bring in Sabathiel and things like that, and they have been bringing her up more and more in the lore lately. Mm, but with the Inari having been pushed to the moon at the end of 7th edition, I feel like it makes sense for the Inari to be the natural opponent for Slanesh. Um, plus, of course, if Fulgrim comes back, he's going to have a score to settle with Gilliman, and if there's another loyalist back, them. So I feel like it will more than likely either be the Inari or it will be a bit Gilliman-centric again. Mm, yeah... I'm not sold on that because Gilliman already got his spotlight, but we'll see. Twice. Yeah, twice. He he does not need a third time. Yeah. So, he kind of pushed get... a nerd into a closet and then or, slapped his brother. Or we could get resurrected Celestine. Yeah, it is possible. Well, we do know that Angron is on his way, or somehow the World Eaters along with Angron, are on their way towards Terra. And this was in the um, Demonkin book. So if uh, if Karn actually gets to Terra, it would be cool to see Celestine come back fully powerful to actually challenge Karn. Mm, I mean, last I heard, Angron was on Armageddon and there was a massive Cornate invasion on Octarius as well, but that's at the other end of the galaxy. I don't, I don't, I haven't been able to track Angron since his summoning ritual failed. Can and the Demonkin Codex... 
Can you summon a demon in two spots? No. no. I'd say there was a cornate invasion of Octaris. I didn't say Angron was there. I don't know. Uh. Um, but because his ritual for ri- summoning on Armageddon was interrupted, does that mean he's now on, on basically the banishment clock because he was sort of interrupted? Or can he pop up somewhere else? And also... The Demon King Codex is 7th edition law, and I'm not saying 7th edition law has been invalidated, but we're in, because they've jumped the plot so much forward in time, it makes me think, mm. Yeah, well, depending on how they do the quote-unquote Summer of Slanesh thingy, it may behoove them to uh, have a new release alongside it. Yeah, I maybe. also I also would like to see, because we do know that Sisters are getting an update. Um, chapter approved kind of very much hinted at this. Oh yeah, every faction in chapter approved will get a codex, that's for sure. But one of the biggest things, it would be kind of cool to see like what Reboot Gilliman does to the Sisterhood. Because he could look at the Sisterhood and just go, Alright, you guys are here. You're fanatical. Some of you, most of you, believe that the Emperor is a god. Not all of it's you. It's kind of, isn't that Sisters of Battle 101? Uh, no. Because they're raised actually... by the Ecclesiarchy. Well, yes, but there's several canonesses that actually know the truth of the Emperor. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Gilliman's just sitting there like, all right, you guys are fanatics. You guys are crazy. You guys are zealots. You guys are useful, though. But let's have you guys get better war gear. Okay? This is your uh, wish listing for better equipment. Your, your wish well, listing hard. There's, actually, they... I'm not. Uh, they Oops. do have Thunderhawks in the lore. They do have land speeders. This is canon. This is in the omnibus. However, that's, the sisters... That's not wish listing. That's just ha- included. However, the sisters have that Holy Trinity, Bolt of Flame, and Melter thing, so I wouldn't expect their weapons roster to expand very much, if at all. Oh, no, they're not going to get other weapons. They're not going to... They might get, like, Flamestorm cannons and other fire-based weapons and Melter-based weapons. They very rarely use plasma. In fact, only the Seraphim really use plasma. But they and there's do that have, one cannon S, but yeah. They do have access to plasma weapons. They just kind of don't use them. Holy Trinity. Um, well, I mean, they, they can all take combi plasmas. Yeah, but the law reason is that Holy Trinity. They can also all take plasma pistols. You can keep saying Holy Trinity, but, but the books and the lore point to them having access to all the weapons. I know they have access to it, but they prefer not to, is my point, because that. Which is strange, because plasma is, just re- plasma is just really hot energy thingy. I'm not up on my science. You'd think they'd is. use that. You'd think they'd use that instead of bolters because they burn better. <laughs> um, but it's a bolter. One of the other things that I personally think that they could do is expand the sisters, not uh, um, uh, squad size or things like that, but expand the sisters' lore. Give us how their actual suits operate. I would like to oh, see yeah. a release where. Gilliman actually does go through the war gear of the Sisterhood. You mean gives them the call special? Well, I mean, I just want to know how their damn... um, How their power armor works, because it has infinite energy. You you want to know how they use it without the black carapace. Well, no, I know how humans use uh, use power armor without a black carapace. That's not important. I'm assuming they use something similar to the Terminant armor where it's plugged into the back of their neck and along their nervous system uh, through the skin. So they don't interact with it as quickly, but they can interact with it very fast. My biggest gripe is I kind of want to know where they get their equipment from because it it is said that it's through private sales um, and Mechanicum favors because the Mechanicum hates the Sisterhood and the Sisterhood hates the Mechanicum. So it would be interesting to see them expand upon that. Yeah, nice book would be good. Although, uh, to move on with the question uh, onto video game stuff, look, I just want a Dark Heresy RPG in a video game form. Is that too much to ask? Inquisitor Martyr. That's not what I'm talking about. I That's know. Diablo in space. <laughs> what, you don't want space Diablo? No, I don't. <laughs> 
Yeah, I I actually taught a video on New Year's Day, sort of about what I'm hoping to see in uh, in 2018, law wise and in a way release wise, that gets more models updated. Um, and can we fill in the gaps for like the Tau, where the Dark Eldar are at with the breaking of Kane's Gate and how Comrade's recovered, what the power situation is now that the Lith is out of the picture with the Inari, all of those things is what I'm really hoping to see. Plus, if they do follow the Slanesh route, then I'd be very intrigued to see how they want to play that, who they want to play them off against and all of those sorts of things, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. I also want to know what um, what a Retributor Titan, uh, Titan Legion is. Oh, what? Oh, no. no. It's mentioned in, like, the third edition Witch Hunter book. They just casually say it, and then they just move on to something else. Oh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, Remlays has emerged from his... Uh, Nurgliness and has forwarded something about the Warhammer World Open Day. There's a little promo poster, which oh, yeah. is just posted in the group chat if you want to have a read of it. There's nothing um, much here. It's completely blank, but I think that is a Necron hint. The poster, the poster well, reads as follows. It reads as follows. They have watched. They have waited. They are coming. I don't think they Warhammer watched. World Open Day. Well, so the Triarch. The Triarch Praetorians never went to sleep. Hmm. I mean, I immediately thought Watchers in the Dark, but that doesn't work. With the Dark Ages being already done, yeah. The, the first yeah. thing it screamed to me was Necrons, but I'm willing to be corrected. I'm Obviously, by the time we're watching this video, uh, you guys are seeing this, you'll know, so we're seeing this the night before, and we're kind of intrigued. Yeah, It also the subtext says, look out for big news and announcements from the Warhammer World Open Day, so... Which is apparently sixth of January tomorrow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Keep your eyes peeled, and some big announcement will be happening tomorrow. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Next, I mean, this next. is coming out on the Wednesday after, so they'll have already seen it. But yeah, intriguing nonetheless. Covered in the next episode. Absolutely. So, moving on to the next question: uh, What are your favorite and least favorite models of all time? Sheesh. Favorite yeah. new Celestine. Um, least favorite. Uh, the slaves from the Dark Eldar. I can see that. Yeah. Oh, those aren't slaves. Those are some uh, hideous homunculus creations. <laughs> Whatever they are, they're not human. Agreed. <laughs> I don't even know with me. Like I, I go through phases. Like, I, I see a model and I quite like the look of it, but I sort of, I don't really particularly care for much. What after a period of time, like there are some models that I think are well designed. Like Farsight portrays his character very well. Um, Lilith Hesperax is a very. I don't really know how to convey it, but it's a, it, it sort of conveys who she is in quite a nice way. Uh, I quite like some of the champ. I don't like Typhus, but I quite like Khan of Betrayer's new model. You can tell some... by the way I walk. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Mm. As for Lee's favorite, uh, probably the, I, the Keeper of Secrets. Probably. Yeah, they should probably update that. <laughs> First one came to my mind was the Keeper of Secrets. Mm. Um, hmm. Oh, Abaddon. So, Abaddon? Ah, he's... I like he's Abaddon's not, model, he just bad. needs an update. I like yeah. his pose, I just think he needs an update. He just wants to hug. Oh, don't hmm. start Alexis on Abaddon. What? Oh, I like she, Abaddon. Likes, she, she likes him now, don't worry. I know, We I'm talking about last week. Yeah, like, she she has a huge... Uh, uh, I'm actually you're not going to finish the sentence. Nope. Yeah, you're not going to finish that. <laughs> Abort, abort. Okay, uh, my favorite one is actually has to be the Inquisitor with power sword and bolt pistol because it's uh, it has a special place in my heart. And least favorite is probably the Skitari rust stalkers and Sicarian infiltrators to be uh, just because I yeah. hate how gangly they are. And yeah, I can see that. Everything on them breaks. You cannot transport them in any 
way that's feasible. Like, when I was putting them together, I think I broke, like, uh, like four different legs, and there's, like, five in the box. So, I <laughs> really don't like them. So, yeah, that's there goes my vote. That's fair. Right, uh, this is one I think has been sort of whispered. I don't think it's going to be a thing, but, well, here we go anyway. Ever since Gilliman has taken control of the Imperium, which he kind of has... Seeing as he's had experience with galactic empires, why hasn't he tried to ally with the Tower or at least make a ceasefire? Uh, because he's got bigger things to do. Exactly. Yeah, the, the Tower, not that important. Yeah. In the, I... in the grand galactic scheme of things, compared to the Cicatrix Maledictum, no. Even I agree with that. Yeah. Like, they have their place, and it's in the corner where they should stay. <laughs> I'm just imagining a towel just like, hey guys, can I be important? And there's just an orc, go back to the corner! And he just sits there like rocking back and forth in the corner like, I want to play too, guys. <laughs> right. Well, that's getting animated. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> Indeed. Right, uh, staying with Gilliman, uh, a new question here. What do you think about the new power that Gilliman has given to Azrael and Dante, titling them as Lord Regents over large parts of the galaxy? 9,000 years ago, he dismantled the legions, but now he's giving more leadership to post-humans, question mark? Well, that was, I mean, according to the Malkador short story thingy, that was never supposed to happen. So, uh, yeah, it's it feels like he's just delivering on what he said in the Horus Heresy, where he was preparing all of his sons to yeah, become... Yeah, this is, actually, with the, chapters in quest, yeah, with the chapters in question, that is Imperium Secundus Mark II. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Like, this feels like just as planned, only Gilliman style. Yeah, um, is it the case that Dante's got Imperius, Imperium Nocte, uh, or Noctis, the Dark Imperium, and Nazrael's got the other half, and then Gilliman's Which, just in command? Is that how it works? It, uh, I forget, isn't it called Imperi uh, Imperium Nihilus or something like that? It uh, might be Nihilus, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Noctis Eterna was the, yeah, sorry, Imperium Nihilus is right, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I only Dante's know got, this because new RPG. Yeah, but Dante's got Dark Imperium, and Azrael's got the rest. Is that how it's sort of sounds done? like it? Because I know the Dark Angels are on the Terran side, and the Blood Angels are on the other one. So that is a fair split. Azrael, the Blood Angels have the other side of the galaxy. God damn it, Bilal! <sighs> Next question. Yes. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. No, the Great Horn Nap will not be in 40k. Moving on. That's for Rumblaze. Can you recommend any good Titan centric Black Library releases? Uh, uh, sure. Were... Titanicus? By uh, they actually said, uh, I'm looking forward to read after I finish Titanicus. Ah, never mind. You picked up a good one. <laughs> well, there's a Gav Thorpe novel coming about uh, the Titanicus. Uh, yeah, there's actually coming a slew of Titan novels. So stay tuned to the Black Library page because uh, you're getting what you want. Also, in uh, Master of Mankind, there's a really, really, really good Titan fight in it. You keep bringing this up. I love that Titan fight. Yeah, and then she gets dipped down into the darkness by Drachnian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But whatever. She put up one hell of a fight. And if you want another good Titan fight scene, I point you to Hell's Reach. And if you want a really cool uh, Titan fight scene, I point you to Mechanicum. Yeah. Well, yes, yeah, the Schism of Mars. <laughs> yeah, that, there's a lot of Titans involved. Agreed. Uh, oh, God, everyone wants to talk about Gilliman today. Bloody hell. Sheesh, uh, it's almost like he's popular. Well, this one goes back to old Gilliman uh, and says, since Gilliman regretted in some form destroying Monarchia, what if he'd refused? Well, he... The thing about that is that it wasn't just... It wasn't just him. Like, the Emperor showed up with his spaceship, so he was kind of just there for the ride, really. 
Yeah, but like, it was. I, I don't. I'm assuming the Emperor had his fleet with him and thus could have bombed Monarchy to hell if the yeah. Ultramarines hadn't done it. But it's just interesting to wonder. It yeah, he probably just. Actually, it could have actually been a way of testing his son. Possibly. Well, then, then again, he probably picked Gilliming because he knew he wouldn't disobey. Yeah, because like very like Sanguinius would have followed through despite hating it. Gilliman followed through. Johnson would have followed through. Russ would have followed through easy. Yeah, but I don't know how many of the traitors would have. Like, Angron would have said no. Let me invade the fucker. Yeah, uh, Horus. Horus would have been interesting. He... I think Horus would have may have done it actually i think he'd have done it but he'd have certainly had a lot of questions true here's the thing uh wait monarchia happens before he becomes war master right um no monarchia i think is post war master pre fall right i it's think a... the timeline's a little hmm. bit wobbly i actually well the thing is emperor is still Plump, uh, hopping around the galaxy, so I'm guessing he hasn't gone back to Terra by then. Mm, but if you think about it, sort of, I, d I can't remember how far, how long Horus was War Master, but yeah. given given that immediately after Monarchia, Lorgar had a sulk. Actually, then... I I think wait, uh, in First Heretic, they mentioned that like a fifty years or something pass after Monarchia. Right, like, let me guess. It's it's a huge span of time. All right, let me get some dates. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get some dates. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Um. Uh. Not not showing up easy. Uh, no. Uh, actually, let me just try and find a blooming timeline for the Horus Heresy. That might just help. Yeah. If if I had re-listened to First Heretic recently. I would probably know this ah, answer. Okay. But... Monarchia was 43 years before Istvan. Ah, okay. Emperor is still... Well, actually, hold on. I'm... And Olenor... When was uh, Olenor? Uh, Triumph Olenor was... I forgot what way I just want to... Triumph of Olenor was... 000M30. Uh... So... Which was about ten years before the Horus Heresy, which began right. in, no five years before the Horus Heresy. So Monarchy happened thirty-five years before. So Alan. yeah, he is not War Master, meaning I would think he would do it because he has not had overall command. I would agree, because he is one of the well, he is of the his brothers. He is known for being damn ruthless. On, on level with Russ. Fair. Fair. So, yeah, well, what was the original question again? Um, what would have changed if he'd not done it? So, like, would he the Emperor would... have rebuked Gilliman in some way, or... Most would likely, have... and gotten someone else to do it. Yeah, here's probably. The, here's, the thing, here's the thing, though. Uh, just to, I know I keep bringing up the Malkador short story and the whole... Uh, it was planned from the start thingy, but it's it fantastic. Does, plot point it, carry on. It, here's here's the thing about that. It does kind of explain Monarchia. He is trying to uh, favor some of his sons, and Lorgar obviously is not one of them. Yeah, he kind of wants to set the train into motion because if you think about like how the Horus Heresy came together, the only wild card and mistake really was Magnus. Yeah. He no doubt had a like he was probably most likely he wanted to stop Magnus from looking into chaos, which is why he sends when he finds out that uh, he's still doing it, sends Russ to bring him to Terra so he can keep an eye on him. And Except, Nikea. And Nikea. Yeah, that, that explains like he's trying to keep things hidden while he's sending them out and favoring some and not others. Also, uh I think that uh uh, Khan was one of those he did not favor. Yeah, Khan sort of acknowledged. I uh, think he acknowledged it with Horus. Like we're almost kindred spirits. Uh, yeah, like, we're both just hunters. That is true. It's it's funny how, like, it's funny how it doesn't break anything. That lovely, lovely plot point, except it does uh, focus things a bit. Yeah, because it's very interesting when we had the debate last week or, or last time on the podcast about. 
who would have been on the kill list. Um, and as you compare the list we made, there were three or four traitors that we kept alive. And But the thing is, the more I think about it, I think, well, actually, maybe he was intending to kill Horus, and maybe Fulgrim was just too much of a prima donna to keep around, and the loyalist whoa, would whoa, have just... Whoa, 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 whoa. You do not talk about Bay Fulgrim like that. I can do I'm... it. I'm talking in hypotheticals, because if you think about it, if, if Magnus was the only wild card, because Prospero was entirely independent from everything else, realistically, it may have been the Emperor was quite happy to send the other eight plus Khan. That is true. So, yeah, it's... The thing... Uh, it probably would have played out just with wolves, because you fix everything with wolves. Yeah. That's fair. Angry politicians? Wolves. That is true. Now, what do the various factions do with recovered Eldari soul stones? Obviously we know what Slanesh does, but what about everybody else? I know what the Mechanicum does. They usually poke around with it, uh, maybe uh, juicing it up as a motor force and then hand it over to the Order of Sinos. If any other uh, Imperium faction doesn't, the Order of Sinos shows up. Uh, Tau? I don't think they've ever had one. Uh, well, they'd have no way of studying it because it's so psychically active they wouldn't really know what to do with it. What's this shiny rock that they were carrying? Oh, probably good luck charm. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's carry it. And then I they mean, get killed by it... the Dark Eldar. <laughs> <laughs> That should be interesting to see what the Dark Eldar do with Eldari Soul Stones. I think they throw them out of Kimura if they see one, because they don't want the attention. Yeah, I mean, obviously you can't be psychic in Kimura unless you're a Shadow Seer, because you play and, on your own roles. Or uh, Vect picks them up and starts uh, making uh, corrupted Wraith structures. Uh, wraith uh, constructs, I mean. And, uh, yeah, sorry, the law of Kimura, which Vect doesn't play by, says Shadow Seers only. Yeah, well, that is true, but The Path of the Dark Eldar is a really good series. Oh yeah, the, the, the whole Path of the Eldar series is one I haven't read, but it does look very interesting. Didn't uh, Inquisitor it's... Hunt actually go with the Eldar to recover soul stones? He did not. Doesn't right. ring a bell. Oh uh, no, don't the... worry, that's, that's, the, that's the Queen's Court Inquisitor, just... Ignore that. No, 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 not not the Queen's Court. Um, the the one from the Battlefleet Gothic. Uh, Horst? Sorry. Horst. Doesn't Horst actually go with the Eldar as a sign of their mutual friendship? Or oh, well, you mean in the in the audio short? Yes. I don't think he does. He's not in the Eldari book. He shows up with Greyfax. No, no, no. During the Battlefleet Gothic uh, books. You mean the game? Well, in the game, I know he does, but I know that's based off of actual lore, except for certain missions where you kill the Chaos Champions. I don't know this uh, piece of I'll have of to look back into it, but I think uh, Horst actually goes with the Eldar to secure some soul stones. Help to... us out here, comments. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Question for Alexis. Yay! Given how, given how specific it is that they want to kill the Fallen, and we're getting an actual ton of them together do you think we're going to get a codex fallen no the codex fallen no they're going to be in the index that's it okay and a question for me what do you want to see in codex tau slash codex farsight enclaves well for a start we're not going to get codex farsight enclaves i well i highly doubt it um personally uh and honestly i think they had the chance to do in chapter approve what i was hoping for which was you know reduce a couple of points cost somewhere, because, like, why does a broadside cost as much as a bloodthirster? It's a bit silly. Residue from 7th? Um, no. Uh, broadside in old game was, what, 80, 90 points a dude? Now they're 200-odd with e missiles. No, no, I mean, what I mean is that weren't they, like, aren't they over-correcting for how broken they were in 7th? True, but then in chapter approved, not a single piece of Tau war gear or units ah, okay. got changed. That that doesn't uh, that story doesn't check out then. I thought that was uh, funny. I, mean, I I was very annoyed. Uh, <laughs> but for things that I want to see, I'd like to see 
lore wise uh obviously flesh out the fourth sphere like what happened to it a little bit and give get the fifth sphere and the context regarding what's going on with farsight and she shadow sun who the next ethereal supreme is need those answers please gameplay wise gameplay wise um i'm not sure because i haven't got any experience within all the tower units like um i've just bought some griff hounds uh for age of sigma that i want to try as crude hounds um, so I can see how Kroot actually work as an army and whether they could be expanded upon with like a Narlok monster so you can actually build a proper alien auxiliary uh, army. Uh, I, honestly, I wouldn't mind them nerfing commanders a little bit in order to bring everything else up to stop it being just commander spam. For example, the Riptide is hot garbage. The Ghost Keel to me feels like hot garbage. Still suits are decent, but Crisis suits pretty much suck unless you're spamming flamers. Uh, the basic infantry, I don't know. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of things that I think would be interesting, but I don't know if they'd be any good. I would like to actually see, like, Headhunter Kindred and um, Vulture Kindred and the uh, Master Shapers and the Shapers Council get expanded on. For those of you that don't know, those are crew. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, personally, I just want to see Demir on the tabletop, just because... The thing is, I think they're entirely space bound, but not well. Sorry, that their only relation to the tower has been pretty much in space, so I don't think that's going to happen, unfortunately. I guess I, I in my mind, I picture some sort of a Caradron Overlord thing. That I mean, would be cool. Expanding that, the demiurge would be a way of bringing back the squats because that's essentially uh, what they are. Yeah, yeah. the pseudo squats. Pseudo yeah. squats, yeah. Sino squats. That's cool. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, just a little quick one. Uh, did the Emperor ever explicitly mention the existence of Omegon, or was he literally just only mentioned in like, the Alpha Legion internally between like those in the Super No? I, no, he has never specifically mentioned him. Uh, because the follow-up goes, could it be that Omegon is a clone of Alpharis created later rather than an actual identical twin? No, in First Heretic, uh, Argal Tal sees that one of the stasis parts holds two instead of one. Right, okay. Uh, okay. Do, 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 do. I'm not going to try and call that one out. That's too dangerous. Um, so one, uh, there was a question last time about the Nightbringer. Uh, like, why, I think we maybe misinterpreted it according to this person. Um, it's not why is his aesthetic the Grim Reaper, it's why is his design aesthetic so terrible because he looks like a half-naked emo with a pathetic scythe, not scary abs, and an obnoxiously large and silly mouth. So how... why is his design so shit? Oh, uh, how old is that model? Old. From ah. early 3rd edition? It's, there you go. It's been around as long as the Necrons have. There's your answer. Yeah. It's old. I like the Nightbringer. I think it looked pretty badass. I really like the converted Sanguinius from the Nightbringer model. Yeah. Anybody remembers that? All right. Next one. Next what do we got? Um, okay. This is related to the Tyranids. Is it possible that a splinter fleet of High Freak Kraken was separated from the Norn Queen, leaving a Swarm Lord as impromptu leadership of said splinter? No. Fleet? Also, is High Fleet Kraken's Norn Queen even alive? Um, well, for Norn Queen lore, essentially what happens when a Norn Queen dies, uh, every single fl- every single ship feels it. They they all get a psychic backlash, and they'll start immediately trying to make a new one. And they fire them out into different directions across the galaxy to save the fleet. It's a defense mechanism. Uh-huh. The fleet itself can actually ma- manage without a Norn Queen, so long as there is a strong enough psychic presence aboard the ship. That being said, the second the Norn Queen is dead, they will flee. Agreed. And given that Kraken was under space assault from none other than Prince Ariel, who's pretty much got one of the best fleets the galaxy's ever seen, given its reputation anyway, I, uh, unless a very early splinter fleet of crack splinter off of kraken was able to develop its own non queen and thus become a separate high fleet well kraken I is think... still alive it's mentioned in the tyranid codex as like... in alive in the same way behemoth's alive or ac- 
actually alive. Like, they're all still active. 200 years is apparently enough time for all of them to just grow back. Yeah. And add some new ones, because reasons. Actually, I quite like High Fleet Cronus and how they've been introduced to... um, I love High Fleet Cronus. Mm. Actually, have you guys read Devastation of Baal? I have not. Um, because I was, I picked it up quite recently, I was having a read of it, and it actually characterizes the hive mind. Ooh, okay, I'm picking that up. Um, I won't spoil it, because it's still pretty recent, but it actually talks about, like, what the hive mind is, and how it kind of works a bit. Alexis, this is important. Yep. So, yeah, it's quite early in Devastation of Bar, like, chapter three or four, but it's very interesting to actually get the the hive fleet characterized as, like, what it is to some extent it's not like a car- a categorical definition but it is very interesting nonetheless yeah the only other representation of the hive mind is the tyranid com- campaign in dawn of war 2 retribution which is not the freshest of source material no so yeah next question um a little bit of more recent lore. Uh, since we now have uh, the northern part of the galaxy, Dark Imperium, cut off, how do ships traverse the wall? But are there like tunnels through the rift that let the Astronomicon shine through, or what? This is something I want answered, and I have not found an answer to, because, as some people may know, there is a new 40k RPG coming out set in the Dark Imperium, and I want to know how they get around. Well, it's... The way I've always read it, and this comes from, like, the Emperor's Legion book, it's not that it's impossible, it's just... Dangerous as fuck. It's really tough and dangerous. More dangerous than usual, let's be, let's be fair. Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, that, that sister, uh, the Sister of Silence fleet flew all the way through the eye and everything to Terra. Yeah, that is true, and it was probably the most harrowing thing in that book, so yeah, it is possible but don't expect your navigators to stay alive i mean i think what only one of hers did yeah yeah and that was the cranky one that hated her but apparently yeah, all... it was like Appar- we can't... here's here's the thing that bugs me about navigators they're not psychic but apparently they hate the sisters of silence and blanks i'm not sure about that one i think the only logic I can give to that is that because they are sensitive to the warp in the fact that they can see it, the Sisters of Battle disrupt what they can see, I guess. Uh, well, they don't actively use the third eye when they're not steering, so I'm not True, sure. But maybe, it's, imagine... maybe, it's just, maybe it's just a mutation thing. Yeah, and I have to imagine having a Sister of Silence cohort on your ship when you're trying to steer and they're fucking with everything warp-related must be quite frustrating and painful and annoying. Although it, it was cool to hear her say that she could open up the um, the the thing on the window so she could actually see out into the warp. And, and she's like, she I wonder what would not, happen. Yeah, she... I'm not... I'm not 100% sold on that because that's not how that should work. But never mind. Mm. Although if we want to talk about things related to the warp that shouldn't work, I want to bring up the Iron Warriors driving into a black hole. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look, it was in the Eye of Terror. You can suspend physics. Yeah, sorry, I'm a physics student. It's kind of my job. <laughs> yeah, true, true. But but do remember that, actually, they should probably explain what the hell, how the hell he got from that black hole thingy to Talar and, and why he wanted to be there. Because uh, men... After okay. having after having uh, done the Perturabo video, they really don't explain that well, uh, particular well, story. Beat. Well, I just did the Talon Desert Raiders, and I did the Iron Warriors a while ago. Um, and the fact they got spat out of a Talon was complete bad luck. And then Perturabo stuck around because he heard about the Black Oculus, I think. Yeah, that... And man, it, it just felt like they needed a tank battle, so they got a tank battle. Like yeah. I like, like I like the Talarn books. They are incredibly atmospheric, but man, do I find the whole thing pointless. Actually, come to think about it, pointless words is kind of what Perturabo does. Yeah, but like I, honestly, like I don't dislike the Iron Warriors. I just find them extremely meh in everything they do. 
They are just meh. Mine is, ba- mine is better as Dantioch. <laughs> oh yeah, Dantioch's badass. And Marek Draeger, shout out to Marek Draeger, um, who went traitor, then went loyal again. That was pretty cool. It was actually funny when I looked up um, official artwork, because I try to use as much official artwork as possible in my uh, my lore videos. There's there's only two pictures of Perturabo. Oh yeah, we also need his demon Primark thingy, because he's... Oh, they, I'm so scared Primark. they're going to stuff that up. I'm so scared they're going to stuff that up. <sighs> Maybe. It's just an it's... obliterator. Uh... With wings. Yeah, that could be messed up. I can I can share your fear on that, Michael, but who knows? Maybe maybe they'll get it right. Maybe. Okay, uh something for Dark Angel since this all sorts uh Alexis all out, which she knows the Dark Angels lore quite well. Uh in the law section of the new Dark Angels Codex, the Fallen have gotten a seemingly very powerful demon prince with the head of a Calibanite lion named Marbus. Is that true? I have yet to read the lore in that book, so I will get back to you. Uh, let's save that question for next week. It okay. sounds like something they would do. Well, the question goes on, do you think it could be Zahariel? And for those who don't know who Zahariel no. is... <laughs> yeah, for those who don't know who Zahariel is, because uh, I'm pretty sure I wrote his name down somewhere. Yeah, Zahariel was pretty hey. much... He's Cypher. Well... well it, well, he was the, the heresy era cipher. He was the last known cipher that we yes. are aware of, because yes. we don't know who the current one is. Yeah, that was that's easy. It's cipher. You give up your name when you become the cipher. God yes, you do. It. You do. You do give up your name when you become the Lord Cipher. But as in the last person to take the title, to our knowledge, was the Hario, and he was scattered by the Chachulcha engine, which has time-based shenanigans. So, it, yeah. yeah, we. He, they, they kind of pulled the Vulcan here, b- b- meaning we answered the question and then we hit him again. <laughs> yeah, Which they really have to stop doing with Vulcan seriously. <laughs> yeah, Let's give the Primark a break. <laughs> okay, um, where are we at time wise? We're at about ninety minutes. Okay, um, with the strong theory of Celestine and Sanguinor being Imperial war entities, generic. Yeah, since, they also. Uh, okay, finish the question. Sorry. Uh, since the Green Knights were in the warp thanks to Malkador shenanigans and spent seventy years Titan time there, what are the chances of their chapter being material bound Imperial? Di- what? What? No. Oh. <laughs> it, Remlays wouldn't even touch this. <laughs> well, we do know Aegis armor can be possessed. Yeah, that's different. There are actual new just Grey Knights in there. Yeah, I mean, um, them being imperial bound demons. No. Huh. Like, I mean, Janus is kind of, because he was a shard of Magnus Fuser Rebul Arbiter, who took the name of a familiar. But. Yeah. The, this is, like, this is stretch. I don't even know how I would justify that. I mean, the Gullerfields were, like, the dark. Yeah. The Grey Knights had the most powerful Guller fields, and this was all planned by Malkador. And oh yeah, Malkador set it up, I know. All planned by yeah. Malkador, cohorted by Garrow. He and... kind of helped. Oh well, yeah, Garrow was collected more Malkador's the right-hand man. Yeah. yeah. But just, no, to end, well, here's the thing, now... Not sure about the whole Sanguinor thingy because they technically gave the origin story for that one in the Herald of Sanguinius, and yeah. I'm not sure what the hell he's supposed to be. I thought, yeah, I... to be honest, he kind of seemed like a Satan in that. Ah, stop! You've been listening to Mope, haven't you? A little bit. Stop well, that. I, well, I covered the Sanguinor yeah. a long time ago, and I've covered the origins of the Sanguinor in my Blood Angel stuff, and. I do not believe that the original Sanguinor that we got in Imperium Secundus is the current Sanguinor. I just can't buy it because there are too many shenanigans evolving his appearance and disappearance for it to be just a dude. Well, there, there are two ways to look at this. Number one, he's actually become some kind of warp entity based on the identity of 
the Herald of Sanguinius, or he's just a title that they keep giving some blood angels because of tra tra uh, tradition, who keeps showing up willy-nilly like Cypher. So mm -hmm. The problem with that argument is how the hell does he manage to always turn up exactly where he's needed, at exactly the right moment to bail them out, and then disappear without a trace? I, I call that the Grumbrindle slash Green Knight syndrome, where... Well, the you, Green Knight uh, was a mythical, was a semi-mythical. Well, that is true, but Grumbrindle, Grumbrindle wasn't. So uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a trope that Games Workshop likes to trot out yeah, every now it and, just, and then. It just seems so similar to the Legion of the Dam that I find it hard to argue. Yeah, all... I guess. I mean, Cypher does his disappearing act all the time. He's not warp. He's not a warp entity, as far as we know. True, but he can also use the webway, seemingly. <laughs> Yeah, I or at guess. least he's got good friends with people who can. Wait, using the webway? Yeah. You mean like Kion? No, I mean Look, like Cypher. He, Kion knew war, one war, uh, webway route. That does not mean much. No, Kion knew several. Alexis, I listened to those books three times. He says he oh, knows oh, the several. Talk down. <laughs> He knows several, and that's why he's the most expensive person to bring along. I will contest that later. Nah. Alright, um, has there been any mention of the Silent King since 8th edition dropped? Nope. And do you think he will appear as a Gilliman-esque character for the Necrons? Wouldn't God, that I be hope lovely? So. Wouldn't that I be lovely? hope so. Uh, look, did you listen to the, uh, rewritten uh, uh, Blood Angel uh, Necron uh, Brofist. Uh, no, I haven't actually. It's fu it's amazing. It's that Silent King shows up with Sanguinius's face. What? <laughs> yes, it's great. <laughs> uh, as in, he has a mask of Sanguinius on his face and he doesn't say anything and his herald keeps spouting some apparent lies that the Silent King tried to make a deal with Sanguinius sometime in the past, and then the uh, then the Blood Angels were going to nuke everything, <laughs> but they didn't. <laughs> yeah, they. Uh, it, it's amazing how much uh, Games Workshop has been busying themselves with uh, rewriting Matt Ward stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, you should you should uh, you should pick that one up. It's kind of great. <laughs> Fair dues. Uh, right, where are we? Um, this is just something that, uh, it's come up from last time. You mentioned, Alexis, the whole thing about the Celestial Orrery being wrecked. Yeah. Um, someone's asked for the source on that, because apparently in Gathering Storm, Trazin was there. Um, I will have to look for that. Uh, but if they want the sort, they can, uh, the s source, uh, they can join me in my Discord and ask for me... Ask for it there. Okay. Shameless plug. Uh, real quick, what is the Celestial Ori? I forget. It is a place, bunker, planet thing that the Necrons have that is basically the best galaxy map you've ever seen. Oh, it's one of the Doom weapons that got destroyed, right. <sighs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. Is like, I don't know what source there is on it being destroyed because the last I heard it was still there. Well, I kind of assumed that they, that Games Workshop kind of realized that they couldn't have all these Doom weapons and not let the Necrons use them. Well, to be fair, actually, when they talk about the Orrery, they describe it as, like, gardening duty. It's like, if there's too much in the galaxy, they just snuff a star out here. It's not a doomsday device that they use to destroy everything. It's for pruning the galaxy to make sure that it's not overcrowded almost. Oh, Snuffing yes. out a star implies that the star is going to go supernova and kill everything. Yes, but I, I'm aware of that, but they don't do it to like, I want that system destroyed, boom. That's not how they do it. It's That's... to make them creepier. Yes. I don't know, I always thought the Necron super weapons were like really idiotic and I, I can't help but wonder why they didn't use them against the, the Eldar. Well, they kind of probably did. That's what probably made the war in heaven so epic. 
Ooh. The War in Heavens. It's so epic. It's been rewritten five times by five different people and has five different... Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, yeah. there's two Details. wars in heaven. Details. Well, there's, there's two wars in heaven. There's the War in Heaven. There's the War in Heaven told by the third edition Necron book. There's the War in Heaven told by the seventh edition Necron book. Uh, yeah. they're, they're all different, and yet they're the same. And Black Library, instead of, like, making a book about the War in Heaven, we're just like, eh, whatever. Okay, um, since you two both seem to espouse, or Alexis especially seem to espouse Talon of Horus as the best things in sliced bread, um, after reading the section about the Fire Tide, how is the Emperor being a god with his own angelic demons still a theory, given the Radiant Worlds? I mean, that's pretty well could you hold on could you rephrase that question again i'll read the question for you word for word i'm currently reading talon of Horus and i have to ask after reading the section about the fire tide how is the emperor being a fully fledged god with his own angelic demons still just a theory doesn't the existence of the radiant worlds overtly confirm it well now i may be misremembering but wasn't it just demons burning on the radiant worlds from the light of the astronomicon that's how i've read it as well yeah it was like it wasn't it wasn't angelic figures oh he may be talking about uh imperious oh that's him he is technically an imperial demon although he is the avatar of the astronomicon yeah oh God, this is messy yeah this uh this is kind of clunky, and it only happened on one chaos ship, and they kind of stabbed him. So, yeah, theory is still up. Don't uh, hold your <laughs> breath. This is Ar this is Aaron Dembski Bowden we're talking about. He kind of likes doing this. <laughs> oh, ADB is a brilliant shenanigan writer, but God, it really he is. <laughs> it's yeah. why I love him so much. Yeah, ADB writes many shenanigans. <laughs> oh, and uh, I will second Alex's opinion that uh, Talon of, uh, that the Black Legion series is the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> well, it's Actually, either Master Mankind I, or it's Talon of Horus that you bang on about the most. I will say that my top three is um, the Talon of Horus, uh, Master Mankind, and Fulgrim. I still think Master Mankind, then Fulgrim, then Black Legion. Are we talking old friend. Fulgrim or new Fulgrim? Uh, As the, in Fulgrim the Palatine Phoenix or Fulgrim, Fulgrim. I mean, oh. Fulgrim, Fulgrim. Quick tangent about the Palatine Phoenix. There's an inconsistency in it. Oh, no. Well, it is the most minor thing, and I understand why no one that I have heard of has picked up on it, but this is going to be super petty, by the way. Uh, <laughs> when the Stormbird lands for the first time on a basis, I think the planet is called? Yeah. Fulgrim and Pike, uh, Prime Iterator Pike, when they're about to walk out, he puts his helmet on. Now, I'm not sh I don't remember what his helmet looks like, but apparently he is scanning the crowd with it, and then he smiles at the hereditary governor, which I'm not sure how he does that without removing his helm, which he apparently oh, did. Wow, that is nitpicky. But yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I am super nitpick when it comes to this, but this is just me taking a shot at Josh Reynolds, which I really shouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, like, if, I, I, I can only imagine how much you must have flipped out when you read about the land raider that turned into a razor back then back into a land raider. <laughs> Look, I haven't touched CS Godo, and I never will. Fair. I'm pretty right. sure all of us have agreed. Like it's it's a it's an unwritten rule, and even Black Library themselves follow that. C.S. Godo, yeah, everything is canon. Everything is not true, but C.S. Godo is not canon. <laughs> <sighs> right. Uh, okay. Question for Alexis. Yeah. How, if at all, are you, the Yin Khan and Ivrain being used in competitive play? Why are they asking her? Because I play competitively. Do you play against Inari? Yeah, I've played against them quite a few times. Uh, oh. Usually they're just tossed into a, a vehicle and thrown at the enemy, along with Seer's Council and a whole bunch of other things. I mostly see her in armies that are just Harlequins, though. Uh, she provides a lot of psychic support and really good close combat. The Incarn is kind of just there as a way to absorb wounds, but... Really, whenever I see Eldar, 
Um, I always face them, and they're always Harlequins. They're always having this stupid fusion pistol and always bounding across the entire battlefield in one turn. Yeah, but, that's Harlequins for you. That's the yeah, only time but... I've actually seen her in battle. Um, she doesn't really see competitive play as much that I've seen. Now, keep in mind, I'm still waiting to see the results of um, Las Vegas Open. And I want to see the lists there that are being played. I know my one buddy is actually bringing one of my lists, and that's really cool. Nice. Fair enough. Okay, uh, this is a interesting as well. Okay, why are the Eldari always getting, in this person's own words, boned? Uh, they always get their ass kicked, their avatar of Kane's a pushover. Are they just destined to fail? Can Can I answer this one? Shoot. Because Games Workshop really wants to hammer home the dying race kind of thing. This is kind of the whole High Elf being repeated from Warhammer Fantasy. This is This has more to do with narrative reasons more than anything else. But do you think they'll actually... Be doomed to fail, or will the Inari turn it around? Hmm, that I... They, now, they will exist in a nice little equilibrium where they keep resurrecting dead Eldar just so there's more Eldar to kill. <laughs> okay, um, I am a little bit tight on time, so I'm just going to try and find a good one to wrap this up. The uh, last one? Yeah, our last question. There's a few more here, but I'm a little bit at low on time. Cherry pick. Uh, that's is that the one I'm gonna do? Um that is that requires Remlays, I think, being here. Um ah, no, I'll I'll do this one. In the last episode, or the video this comment is on, uh Remlays and I saw Dark Angels and the Lion as boring compared to the other Primarchs and the Space Marine Legions. As a person who has only read Dark Angels books and lore, are the other legions just more detailed, or are they actually likable? The Dark Angels tend to actually sit back and uh, I uh, how do I explain this? The Dark Angels look at battle as an in kind of unnecessary. They will avoid it if they can, and they stick more towards inner lore than outer lore. I.e. they won't talk about their epic and grand battles as much because they don't do them as much. They're yeah, more, the last big one they had, they lost. They're hard. more political than anything else. It's... It's a really good read if you like in-depth stories about giant space gorillas. Now, mm. actually, the thing about Lion, and this I have found interesting because I did him as the first Primarch because... He's the uh, first Primarch. He is the first Primarch, I'm do and I'm doing them in order right now. I have found that his story, he is not the protagonist in almost any of them. It is amazing. Because usually, even when it's ostensibly a book about him, it's usually Curse who drives the plot when it comes to Lion. With the Thramus screw said, yeah, in Imperium Secundus, that's driven by Curse and Gilliman. Um... Yeah, and then he gets pulled along into the Ruined Throne by Sanguinius and Gilliman, and then he's just dropping... Like, I'm not sure how he's going to drop off to Caliban, but that's really where his story begins and ends, because there's really... Nothing for him to do in the heresy. Hmm. I'd say it's, it's, yeah. it's an it's an odd thing because I noticed this when I wrote, wrote his script. Have you done a video on him yet? I covered every legion, so I didn't do the Primarchs alone. I covered them for like a paragraph in my legion law. Ah, there's the problem. I covered like just them, which is yeah. which is I how gave, I got my problem. Yeah, I gave them a paragraph of their origins, and then I sort of tracked how they got on as a general and any events they were involved in as they went along. It was semi-Primarch focused, but also about the Legion. Huh. So it was sort of a bit of both. Well, apparently I'm getting arrested. No, just kidding. Don't worry. It's it's just the Ravenwing coming to get you, fallen uh, heretic. Probably. But anyway. Yeah. yeah, Lion is kind of dull. Kind of. But yeah. he's interesting in... like. Uh, actually, his his uh, legion is way more interesting than he is. Yeah, I think I could agree with that. So there's some interesting characters in there, like Luther and Cipher and Co. I think the reason I find Lion boring um, is because you look at characters like Angron, 
and Magnus, Kurz, um, and even some others. And you sort of, you can connect with them in some way and you can see their side or you can see the uh, the overarching plot what the overarching plot wants you to think about them but also you want to see how they think and they've got a lot of events that they are centric to so magnus has nikea and prospero and uh kurz well you've mentioned kurz pretty much drove the plot of the thranas crusade and Angron, imperium second is true yeah and i think you find those characters much more engaging because you can maybe not relate to them, but... Uh, I kind of have an explanation for why it's so hard to relate to Lion, and I think this is a, write, a writing decision regarding him, because they never actually write down any of Lion's thoughts. You never get what he's thinking, which is on purpose, because he's supposed to be like that. No one is supposed to figure out what he's thinking. But I think that may have hurt him as a character in... The Horus Heresy. Yeah, because it makes it harder for people to relate to what he's thinking because you don't know what he's thinking. But at the same time, even when events are transpiring around him, whether he's influencing them or he's not unable to influence them, you don't you don't feel like uh, I, I can't explain it. But when you read Magnus's, like, Magnus is the one I come back to because Magnus is like my favorite Primarch of them all. And whenever I read Magnus's story, whether it's from his perspective, from Ross's perspective. From anybody's perspective, he is interesting to think about from multiple angles and consider and engage with and maybe not relate to, but try and understand. I, I think that's why Lion struggles, yeah. because I can't I can't connect with him and nobody can connect with him. So I can't connect to him via another character either. Which, to be fair, really is, is the point. One, of, one of his biggest character traits. You can't connect with him which is why all of the bad things happen to him and his legion so yeah maybe uh the black library writers are smarter than we give him credit for yeah um, but yeah it's got it's definitely a design decision to make lion of the dark angels that way but it it doesn't help them in terms of being seen as interesting unless you really really care about the fallen i and luther as a plot point because luther is interesting yeah, he's way, like, listening to him talk and reason and hear his thoughts, yeah, you can really get into his head and really like him, even if he is he's treason dick. of scum. Yeah. <laughs> Have you actually listened to Grey, uh, Grey Angel or something like that? No. Um, it's a book where the team that's following Garrow actually goes to the Dark Angel homeworld and they're just sitting there doing reconnaissance. I um, have. Yeah, that's where my and Torn and Kurz go, don't they? Yeah. yeah. And they're just like, they talk to a Watcher in the Dark, they talk to Cypher. And, well, no, they don't talk to the Watcher in the Dark. They see the watch. They don't see it either. They feel it. Um, they talk to Cypher, they talk to Luther, and then they're just like, we, they're traitors. Yeah, Loki gets captured, right? Yep. Um, does he? I, yeah, I, I, I distinctly remember Luther interrogating him. Yep, he is interrogating him the entire time. Ah, there we go. Well, nice. technically he says it's not interrogation. Well, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interrogation. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that will wrap up the questions. As always, I know I've missed a few because we're a bit tight on time, but leave your questions in the comments below with the word question, and I'll endeavor to answer them or ask them for be answered to be answered next time. Um, so, to wrap up, I suppose, does anybody have a rant they particularly want to unload? I do. Uh-oh. Go for it. So, so this is going to be, once again, super nitpicky, but... I had a feeling like it was going to be. Yeah, so, this has to do with the Black Crusade core rulebook, and they have a little blurb about the Emperor's children. Now, do take note that this book is written from the traitor perspective, meaning odds, uh, odds are most of it isn't correct or the way you're used to seeing things. However, I'll just read it straight from the book because this regards to the Emperor's Children's Fall and this is her uh, like during the heresy. <clears throat> the Emperor's Children were one of the legions assigned to crush Horus and his rebel on Isman 5. That's, once again, not true. Wrong. 
During a power lay, uh, the Legion's Primarch Fulgrim and his highest ranking officers were corrupted by the decadence pastime that Horus and his chaos worshippers offered. Wrong again. Drugged, pleasured, beyond endurance, and finally broken, they agreed to aid Horus. Wrong again. The rot spread quickly through the Legion, and the Emperor's children embraced chaos in all its depravity. Like... Semi-right. Semi-right, but wrong in context. Like, someone at Games Workshop, like canonized this because all of the fun, uh, all of the uh, f- uh, well when was this written this is from 2014 oh. or, like this is new yeah there's like, there's no real excuse for it yeah this was like 1993 when they were just no, establishing the whole no, heresy no 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 hold on let me double check what the what the release date on Black Crusade was uh I feel like this is something that they did, uh, that someone third party did, I'm feeling like, and just GW forgot to double check it. Like, this is some, like, this is at the start of the book, this is the introduction to the heresy. So... Yeah, it's either they've... uh, Yeah, it's uh, one of two things seems to have happened here. Either GW did a shit job at remembering their own lore, or they sold it out third party and forgot to proofread it. Yeah, uh, let's see. Oh, no, never mind. It is, like, it wasn't quite 2014. It was released in 2011, but this is still... Still no excuse. Still no excuse. Like, even if it has been six, no, eight, uh, seven years, this Fulgrim is, like... and the Horus Heresy books are older than that. Yeah, that is, like, this is... Even if they were going for the whole traitor perspective, this is not... Uh, like, this is even more wrong get it, which is odd. Yeah. Usually the wrong censored version. So yeah, that's my rant. That's a shot at uh, somebody. Fa- Fantasy, oh, Fantasy Flight Games. Man, I was blanking on the name. They were the uh, they were the guys that handled the old RPG uh, uh, line. Yeah, Fantasy Flight do a lot of stuff. Well, they yeah. did also completely just copy the original text for the Space Marines um, implants word That's for word. Fine. Well, they copied it word for word, even though there were newer sources that changed all of that. Well, someone then, the licensing director at Games Workshop, was apparently not doing his job, so I'll blame him. Yeah. Right. Alexis, well, do you have anything? I have something, but it's it's a bit more personal, and I don't really want to talk about it. So, That's no. understandable. Um, for me, um, I'm a little bit disappointed with how much particularly the Tau got in chapter approved, but that's a really minor detail. Um, like the Tau. hey huh. oh, they're going. The, they're going the oh. way of the squats. No, anyway, kidding. ladies and gentlemen, and everything in between, including demonic individuals who are probably just being assholes in the comments... That has been everything for episode 35 of Adeptus Podcasts. And I do hope you have enjoyed it. It's been a bit more of a serious episode, a bit less of Remlazy shenanigans, because we didn't have a Remlaze. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed it nonetheless. I know some people quite like the serious style like we had with Gav Thorpe. So I hope you've enjoyed it nonetheless. Anyway, thank you very much to Viggy for joining us on such short notice. It was much appreciated. No worries. My pleasure. And uh, I get the feeling that you, if uh, you can be convinced to come back in the future, you and Romulus will have some very interesting conversations if we can oh, get on. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll pencil that one in then. <laughs> so, thank you very much for watching. This has been Tactica Imperialis. I'm Alexis the Ego Queen. Love me. And I'm Vicky the GM. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much. And goodbye.